My name is David Petrosky. I'm an attorney and I represent landlords on eviction cases in California. The topic of today's presentation is going to be giving you an overview of the California eviction process from start to finish. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I've been an attorney since 2004. I'm a published author and a great referral source for realtors, landlords, and other attorneys. I'm consistently rated as a five-star attorney, and I get results. But of course, there's no guarantee of success on any one case. Okay, let's get started. The California eviction process can be broken down into two different categories. You have to decide why are you evicting the tenant. You're either evicting the tenant because the tenant's at fault or not at fault. So what does that mean? Well, an at fault tenant eviction is when you're evicting the tenant because of something that they are doing that they're not supposed to be doing. For example, the tenant stopped paying rent while the tenant's at fault because they're not paying rent. Or the tenant is allowing a pet to be at the property when the lease says no pets. Or the tenant is smoking at the property against a no smoking policy in the lease. These are three examples of an at-fault eviction. A no-fault eviction, on the other hand, is an eviction where you are evicting the tenant not because of something they're doing or or not doing that they're supposed to be doing, but rather you're evicting the tenant for some other reason. For example, maybe you want to sell the property and you want to sell it vacant, or maybe you want to move into the property or you want a family member to move into the property, or maybe you just don't want to rent the property anymore. These are examples of no-fault eviction. And it makes a big difference on whether the eviction is based on an at-fault tenant reason or a no-fault tenant reason, especially in rent control jurisdictions. Many rent control areas, such as Los Angeles, limit in a substantial way the ability of a landlord to evict a tenant for a no-fault eviction. And if the landlord is able to evict a tenant for a no-fault reason in a rent control area such as Los Angeles, the landlord is going to have to pay substantial relocation costs to the tenant. You're going to want to read and become familiar with two different code sections. Code of Civil Procedure 1161 talks about at-fault evictions, and you would use a three-day notice in most cases for these types of evictions. And you also want to become familiar with Civil Code 1946 and 1946.1, which outlines no-fault tenant evictions, most commonly that would be used with a 30-day or a 60-day notice to terminate the tenancy in California. Okay, now I'm going to briefly go through a step-by-step process of what a typical eviction case might look like. Please note that this is a very simplified process and your case may be more complex and it might not fit into this step-by-step process. Step number one, the landlord's going to need to create and serve a termination notice on the tenant. This might be a three-day notice, it might be a 30-day or a 60-day notice. The landlord then needs to wait for the notice to expire. Did the tenant comply and do what the notice told the tenant to do? And if yes, then there's nothing else for you to do. But if the tenant did not comply with the notice, then you got to move on to step number two. Step number two is the actual filing of the unlawful detainer or eviction case at the courthouse. You're going to want to have the tenant served and all unknown occupants. It's very important to have all unknown occupants served because that will help you later on if someone tries to file a prejudgment claim, and that's not within the scope of the presentation today. Once you file the unlawful detainer and have the tenant served, you need to wait the appropriate number of days to see if the tenant is going to respond and contest the case or not. 
If the tenant fails to dispute the case, that's good for you. You can request a default judgment for possession of the property and skip down to step number five. But if your tenant contests the eviction case and files, for example, an answer, then the landlord's going to have to go back to court, request a trial date, and prepare for the trial. For step number three, the landlord needs to prepare for the trial, organizing and gathering all the evidence and documentation to have to refute the tenant's allegations raised in the answer. For example, let's say your eviction is based on non-payment of rent and then the tenant files an answer saying that they didn't pay the rent because the property is not habitable. That's a very common defense to a non-payment of rent case. Then if that happens, you as a landlord are going to want to go through your pictures, your receipts, whatever evidence that you have to show that the property is and has been maintained in a habitable condition. Now for step number four, you're going to want to appear in court on the trial day. You're going to try to settle the case if possible, but if the case is not settleable, then you're going to have to have the trial. Once you have the trial, you're either going to win and receive a judgment for possession of the property, or you're going to lose. And if you lose, generally the tenant is allowed to stay in the property. But if you win, congratulations, you've received a judgment for possession of the property, and now you need to enforce the judgment. Well, how do you do that? Step number six, you're going to request what's known as a writ of possession from the court. Once the court grants and issues the writ of possession, then you will take the original writ of possession and sheriff instructions to the sheriff. Make sure you take extra copies. The sheriff almost always wants multiple copies. And then this is step number seven. For step number eight, once you have delivered the original writ of possession and sheriff instructions to the sheriff's office, the sheriff will mail you a notice of the lockout date. You'll meet with the sheriff at the lockout and that's when you'll change the locks and legal possession will return to you. The tenant will have no right to be in the property after the lockout takes place. I want to point out a few very important things that you should consider as a landlord. First, time frames can vary widely on eviction cases. It really depends on which court you're at and, and you're limited on what court you can use because it's based on where the property is located. So that's number one, time frames can vary widely. Number two, cost. You are going to spend money on an eviction between the court costs, process server, if you are hiring an attorney, and you should highly consider hiring an attorney to handle the unlawful detainer case for you because there is a very high chance of mistakes with an eviction. And the simplest mistake can cost you the entire case and then you're going to have to start over again from the very beginning and you've then wasted time and money. You also have to consider rent control issues. If your property is in a rent control area such as Los Angeles City, there are a lot more rules and regulations and requirements for evicting tenants. Also, you want to consider having everything served by a process server. They might cost a little bit more than the sheriff, but they're usually faster than the sheriff. And they will also hold more credibility in court as opposed to having a friend serve the paperwork for you. Also, I want to mention that this presentation is an extremely simplified overview of the eviction process, and I've purposely left out a lot of possible steps because there are too many things to discuss in this small presentation. There could be motions, there could be discovery, the tenant could file a demur, demand a jury trial, file a bankruptcy, or many other types of delay tactics. So again, this presentation is an extremely simplified overview of the California eviction process. If you'd like help with an eviction case, visit my website, which is attorneydavid.com. Again, that's attorneydavid.com. You can fill out the form on the website, and we will provide you with a free consultation if you're a landlord and you're located within one of our service areas. I also publish an evictions blog with a lot of helpful information and best practices for landlords. 
Finally, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. I regularly post updates and helpful information for landlords on those sites. Thank you so much.